Hey everyone, uh, welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at a Mass Effect 3 piece I did. Um, just a piece of fan art. So I'm starting off with a line art sketch, which is uncommon for me. Uh, I usually work with a black, you know, a, a tonal study essentially, pushing and pulling with liquify, eraser, and the brush. Just get a form that I'm comfortable with. But, um, you know, I don't really have the creative control in this situation since uh, Mass Effect uses named characters with established looks, wearing specific armor with known details, so I can't really take all of the liberties I would when I, if I was doing a personal piece. Um, so anyway, I'm doing a line piece here just to make sure that all the details are correct. Um, as you can tell, we're doing a Fem Shep, or Female Shepherd, for those who aren't familiar with the game. Um, and she's just going to be wearing the armor that's been shown in all the promotional pieces uh, since Mass Effect 3 was announced. I believe it's the N7 Spectre armor, but I could be wrong. I haven't played Mass Effect 3 yet. Uh, so the pose I wanted to go with is uh, kind of her looking over her shoulder. She has in one hand a pistol, and in the other hand she has an Omni tool with the blade extension coming out. Um, one cool thing about this piece is that I want it to be nearly photorealistic, um, so I'm going to be doing a lot of texture work later on to establish a more rendered quality to the piece. Alright, so first I had an idea of having an open hand and no gun, but that changed pretty quickly to have a pistol. Um, I have no shame in admitting this, but I hate drawing geometric things, uh, like regular geometric shapes, especially, you know, boxes and whatever. I, I hate it because there's so much perspective going on, and it's difficult to get it 100% right all the time, and it takes a lot of time to polish it and make it look just right. Uh, I definitely prefer doing organic stuff because, you know, organic stuff doesn't follow straight lines, so there's a little bit more give. Alright, so we've got a nice pose going on, bringing it in a little bit, making it look a little bit more realistic. Um, got to scale down the body to make the head the right size. And I'm just kind of quickly throwing in a background for now. Alright, so we're throwing in some colors. Uh, the armor is actually black, so it's not that much color. Um, I also realized that there had to be a piece or a, a rifle over her shoulder, so that's what I just painted in there, the stock, really quickly. Um, here I'm doing the under mesh and uh, just some detailing. So skin is just like a light pinkish color. Try to grab the color from the hair and uh, paint the lips in. Right now I'm using Multiply to add colors to the face. And now we're adding some shadows with a Multiply layer. Um, shadows are going to be very important uh, to help establish the light source and give volume to the piece. So the light angle is sort of over the shoulder, not backlit per se, kind of more on the same line as the shoulder. <clears throat> and uh, these are just done with a uh, color dodge layer. Now at first I was going to do this sort of blue sky, um, but it didn't really capture the mood that I wanted. I mean this is a desperate struggle for humanity and I don't know, a sunny day doesn't seem right. Uh, now I'm adding some more multiply layers to add more shadowing, refining the shadows, hardening the lines, adding more contrast. Um, one thing I start doing is I'll 
quickly painting a face and then I'll generally ignore it for a while. I find if I do the face right away, I focus on it way too much and I waste a lot of time. It's just much easier if I do everything else first. Um, a lot of the reason, or a lot of the problem I have with faces is that if you haven't got your light source and whatnot, um, 100% by the time you do the face, it will look off volumetrically. Um, so please ignore the face while I do the rest of the armor. All right, now I am had to uh, fix the arm a little bit, reposition it, it was a little bit too far out. Cleaning up some lines on the shadows, give it that geometric look. And uh, one thing that's kind of difficult to grasp is when people do shadows and highlights, um, they sometimes forget that objects have volumetric properties or that they're three-dimensional. So it's really tempting, you know, if you have your light source coming from the left side, to have uh, a gradient essentially coming from left to right on your object. Now what you have to remember is that that only works on a flat plane essentially. It won't work on something that has any depth or size to it. So for example, if you look at the shoulder here, the highlight comes from the center and sort of gradients out. And the reason for that is because there's actually more mass there. It's a curved surface and that's the edge that's closest to the light source. Oh, that's one of my favorite parts. I love doing um, just little spec highlights. So when I say spec highlights, I mean specular highlights. Um, the more reflective or shining an object is, the more intense it's specular highlight. The opposite of specular is diffuse highlight, which is common in dull plastics, cloth, skin, etc. Spin is, uh, skin is a little bit more complex because there's something called subsurface scattering, which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, but pretty much if something is not shiny, it is diffuse. Um, so uh, in this case, the armor is a little bit shiny because it's uh, sort of this like hard plasticky material. So it does get a little bit of a specular highlight. Here I'm just uh, refining the edges using the lasso and we're adding more specular highlights. Um, specular highlights are also really good, or highlights in general are really good at showing um, little details in the surfaces. So as you can see around the edge of the breastplate, um, I'm doing the face so it's a little bit hard to see. This is little notches and those are uh, hinted at by doing little highlights showing where the notch goes in so there's a little bit of a highlight since that surface is facing the light source more directly than the surrounding area. Uh, so right now I'm working on the face. Um, a heads up, this face is not going to last. Um, it looks a little bit weird. She's got sort of a proboscis going on. Her nose is sticking a little bit too much. Also, one thing I really can't stand, there's this weird light angle um, where it's the essentially the different the problem is that it can be very difficult to differentiate the nose from the rest of the face um, if your lighting's weird. Oh, uh, so what I'm doing now is just to, sorry, keep up with the video. Uh, I hated the hand, so I redid it. I eventually found a piece of reference material online, just traced the lines, and then use it as reference for the rest. So it's some sort of gangster pose with a guy holding a pistol sideways. But since I needed the gun to be the top of the gun to be facing the viewer, it works for this one turn to the side. And uh, you can see I'm using the N7 pistol there for reference. And uh, that little red line down the center was just to establish the straight lines. <laughs> and this is sort of funny because I put a lot of love into the pistol, making sure that all the lighting was correct, but it's actually going to be cut pretty much from the piece in the final composition. All right, so here we are adding geometric lighting to the gun. And every once in a while, you see I flit it along and I do a bounce light here and there, add some highlights to the armor, just because I get distracted and see something that I want to work on a little bit more than what I'm currently working on, and I'll just do that for a couple minutes. Or in this case, more than a couple minutes, because as you can tell, I'm doing a lot of little detail work. Right, so I came back to the gun, 
And what I'm doing here is I'm using the uh, polygonal lasso to add big patches of highlights and, sh and uh, shadow. The reason I'm using the polygonal lasso is because it's very useful for creating straight lines because that's what it does. Um, so it's good for shading and highlighting geometric objects and establishing edges. Okay, so here I'm kind of going around and adding some more multiply layers. I'm just sort of adding details via shadow. And I'm messing with the face, trying to get it to look right, and it's not coming out right. Because the problem is that the basic geometry, the original geometry I was working on, isn't right. And uh, you'll see that in a little bit. I realize that the face isn't really salvageable. Um, sometimes the problem with these faces is you'll be working on it for so long that you expect it a certain way, and in your mind you see it a certain way. And um, when it doesn't come out like that, you kind of get stuck, and you just want to keep fixing and fixing. So that's what I'm doing here with the liquify tool. And the more I fix it, the worse it looks, actually. So in the end, what I end up doing, as you can see here, is I just painted over it and started fresh. <laughs> so I start fresh. I reposition the head a little bit. Uh, and there, I'm just establishing, you know, some sketching out a face, pretty much using really basic anatomical uh, marks. You know, line down the center of the face. Eyes are halfway between the center median and the side of the face, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here we go. So I'm going to try the new face, and what I'm doing is I'm sampling the area around it for the shadow color. So I believe this is just all one layer, just a normal layer. And painting in the eyes. Just got kind of a drunken eyelid going on. That's a little bit better. And uh, some big Angelina Jolie lips. And uh, you can't see it on the screen because I use two screens while I work. But I have reference for faces on the other screen. And I believe the two models I was looking at are Olivia Wilde and Michelle Monaghan. Which is sort of a weird combination because Olivia Wilde has a very kind of like canine face, like a fox sort of. She's got kind of a you know long pointy nose. Um, I mean, they're both gorgeous actresses, obviously, but they have very different facial structures. Um, Michelle Monaghan has more of a round um, kind of button nose and a more round face, whereas Olivia Wilde has a very angular face. So the combination is a strange hybrid of the two. So what I'm doing now is I'm using, you can actually see it in the eyes, a little bit of the Olivia Wilde thing going on. Um, so anyway, what I'm doing now is I'm using shadows and highlights to help establish geometry in the face. Um, so this is sort of a cheaty thing I do. I've, I found that whenever I paint a face, uh, especially face at three quarters. Um, oh, to, under, to explain what that means, there are a couple of positions of a face which are commonly used in paintings. There's three quarters, which is what you're seeing now. It's when the face is looking off, and you're seeing three quarters of the face. Um, there's also uh, profile, which is the face completely turned to the side. That's called a profile shot. And then I don't actually know what the other one's called. I think it's just centered or standard. Um, and it's when the face is looking directly at you. And a face looking directly at you is actually the most boring. Um, profiles at least can be a little bit more engaging, but a face looking directly at you is, I mean, it's what you practice with. It's not really what you do a final composition with generally. So a three quarters is more commonly used, but you can use a combination of any of them really. So here I'm fixing up the eyes. She has to have green eyes because that's what the Femshep from Bioware, the official Femshep, the redhead uh, Femshep looks like. Which is actually funny because uh, when I played Mass Effect 1 and 2, I had a redhead, green eyed Femshep. So when I saw the official art for her, I was um, pretty happy. Anyway, um, so now I have to fix the head and the neck. The head was way too far up uh, on the body because she has this giant um, metal collar as part of her armor. And the head would actually be kind of in the collar, not sticking above the collar. All right, so what I'm doing now is I'm uh, using a textured brush to just add some kind of, not blemishes, but freckles and dimples and uh, little pores on the skin. 
and um, kind of buffing out the hair with some highlights. Hair actually has a pretty high specular highlight, um, at least healthy hair, healthy combed hair. And wet hair has an extremely high, anything that's wet has a very high specular highlight. All right, to add some depth between the hair and the face, I painted in some shadows. Um, the way I paint my hair is I use a custom brush. It's actually just a bunch, it looks like a bunch of polka dots. And um, with the right settings, the brush actually makes nice hair. Um, kind of this feathery light um, hair. And the way uh, I've seen other people try to do it with an individual brush, like you know, a one pixel brush or whatever, and they paint each individual strand. That's not actually how hair falls. Um, unless you're touching a Tesla coil, uh, your hair actually comes down in clumps. Hair will stick together and um, it's more natural looking. So make your own brush if you can. Um, maybe in another video I'll cover how I did mine. Uh, right now, I'm painting in the Omni Beam. Uh, sorry, the Omni Beam, the Omni Tool. And uh, the way I did the Omni Tool was I pretty much just did uh, a shape using the pen tool and then I filled it. Um, the reason I did that was because I wanted hard angular geometric edges because uh, that's what it looks like. You know, it's, I'm not sure how to explain it, it's sort of like a laser projection of some kind, but uh, essentially it uses, ge it's not organic, it's very much digital and um, hard lined. Now since I have this excellent opportunity to use a warm light source, since the rest of the light lighting for this piece is kind of cool, um, I'm going to take a color dodge layer and using kind of orangey color, I'm going to paint in highlights around the Omni tool and uh, you know underneath the face as a sort of a bounce light. Um, I use the term bounce light, that's not technically correct. Bounce light is supposed to come from the ground. Essentially it's the idea that light comes from the sun, comes down, hits the ground and then bounces back up and colorizes. Um, but anyway, I usually call light from underneath bounce light even though it's not technically correct if it's coming from another light source. Uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm painting in a texture. What I did was I found this nice texture on cgtextures.com, which is free. Just make sure to sign up and create an account. Um, and uh, I'm pasting these over areas of the armor that need to be texturized. I then convert it to a overlay or a soft light layer. And using a layer mask, I'll paint in the areas that need to be textured. Um, I also have a texture library on my computer now because every time I find a nice texture I like, I'll just save it to my external hard drive. So what I'm doing now is I'm taking this nice scratched metal texture, uh, it's an overlay layer, and I'm just painting it in, and it makes the armor look much more real. You know, it's got nicks, scratches, dents, etc. It's very quick, it's very easy to do, um, and it definitely increases the uh, the realism of the piece. What I'm doing now is I'm scaling the head up because she's supposed to be a petite female, or not petite, but I mean, she's not, you know, an Amazon, so she's fairly normally proportioned. She has a heroic stature. Um, and uh, her body was just too big before. Um, okay, so what we're doing now is I'm just painting in some more highlights. Some more bounce using multiple normal overlay and uh, color dodge layers. Now I'm painting in some scuffs and scratches on the gun to make it look more realistic because, believe it or not, painted metal does chip very quickly. Alright, so this is a fun part. Using a normal layer, I'm painting in the white stripes. And then I had to experiment and I ended up using, I think it's just a color dodge or some sort of layer. I think it was color dodge um, to paint in the white and red armor. Uh, or paint on the armor. Now what I'm doing is using a layer mask and painting in nicks and scratches on the armor using my brushes. Uh, most of these brushes I'm using I think are just actually the normal round brush, but I also use some uh, custom textured brushes. Uh, similarly, right now I'm going in, I'm just painting some little metal peeking through the paint on the armor. Uh, when metal is scratched on armor, you generally can see it because it reflects as a higher specular value than the paint around it. So it'll appear brighter. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm just going through, adding little scratches pretty randomly, you know. All right, what I just do is I flip the canvas. The reason I did that is when you flip the canvas, you actually get a better idea of your composition. Your eye views the piece as a new piece um, rather than the one you've been working on. And it will say, okay, let's look at the composition fresh. 
So I looked at the composition when I flipped it, and it was totally off. She looked like she was leaning over way too far. So I essentially just had to go in here with the lasso, cut and paste, and paint in pieces in the correct positions, because it was totally off. All right, now I'm looking at my reference to make sure that my armor details are correct. The armor is actually very, oh, it's not ornate, but it's very detailed. Uh, here I'm taking the N7 logo I found online, uh, warping it to fit, and then painting in edges to make it, like, make it look like it's embossed in the armor or coming off the armor. A little bit of liquify tool here. Repositioning to get the center of weight correct, uh, center of balance correctly. And uh, just doing more detailing on the armor. Um, when you're trying to paint from reference, it's very important to keep looking at the reference as you paint. Otherwise, you'll find that your your memory tricks you, and you start making little changes here and there that aren't actually present. So I had to be very careful to go back, check it over and over to make sure that all the armor details were 100% correct. Here I'm repositioning the arm because if her arm was back matching the angle of the shoulder, it would actually be a little bit further. All right, so we're fixing up the legs, painting in some geometry. The legs are a little bit too thin now, but uh, I think I fixed that. Yeah. Um, okay, so here we go. A little more liquefying. Legs are still a little bit off. More details. So in some of the official artwork from Bioware, she has these kind of, I don't know how to describe them, they look like, they're like cleavage-y parts of the armor, they're like, <laughs> they kind of draw your attention, they're um, stainless steel versus the rest of the black armor, so I, I added those in. Alright, so we're doing a little more liquefying and uh, adding some more highlights to make sure that the geometry of the face is more easily red. Um, what's sort of funny is I find that I can paint any one part of the face really well. The problem is that when I try to tie them all together, I find that different pieces of the face look like they're from different pictures. Um, I actually struggle with that, trying to make all the pieces of the face look like they're tied together. Um, and lighting helps. Using correct lighting definitely makes that more easy, or more easily uh, done. All right, so we're uh, trying to tie together the face a little bit more, unifying the light and the anatomy. Giving her a hairdo. More liquify tool, as always. Moving the eyes around a little bit. See what I mean? It looks like if only she was wearing a ninja mask, it'd be so much easier. Just don't worry about the nose and the mouth, just the eyes. Um, so I just fixed her nose and her eyes a little bit. Now, the only thing is it did make her a little bit more masculine. Um, just because the cheekbones are more pronounced, the jaw is a little bit more pronounced. Um, so I have to soften it a little bit. Because she's a femme shep, not a androgynous shep, I guess. So smoothing out the geometry, making the harsh a little bit, uh, making the face a little bit less harsh. Another part of the problem is that her body, aside from the breasts, is not that feminine, mostly because she's heavily armored. But um, yeah. it can be really tough to make armor uh, that's convincing and yet not obviously um, a bikini outfit 
And I do like the fact that the Femshev actually has legitimate armor and not, you know, she's not a space princess with a, you know, uh, kind of Red Sonia style steel bikini. And what I'm doing now is I'm creating the background. And the way I do that is I found lots of reference images online. Just go to Google or whatever, whatever your search engine is. Uh, in this case, I think I was searching for like wrecked or abandoned cities. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm sort of creating a collage. Uh, I desaturate everything and I sort of stack it. Um, the reason I'm doing that is that it makes a very quick, very realistic looking background uh, without spending too much time. Um, I'm using a special smoke brush and I crop in the piece to make it a little bit more cinematic. Alright, so now we're painting in the background just using I think, overlay or color layers. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm painting in shadows so that the background looks consistent. It looks like a cohesive uh, kind of photographic background. Um, like it's believable that this is one area and not a photo collage taken from Google. And this takes a while, but the effect is definitely worth it in the end. Now, the cities in Mass Effect are kind of interesting because they use a lot of uh, the older, um, a lot of the older buildings are still present. So, for example, all of the cinematics take place in like London and stuff, and that's really cool. And then if you look in the background, you'll see there's like kind of these modern sci-fi uh, skyscrapers. So I wanted to kind of include those, and I didn't want this to make it. I didn't want to make this any one particular city. Uh, originally, I was actually going to make it London, but I didn't know where in her travels. Uh, Shepard was going to be going in the game, so I didn't want to have it be some random place that actually was never visited. Um, what I'm doing right now is I'm painting out some of the detail from behind the uh, Omni Tool Blade, and instead what I'm doing is I'm making it look like uh, sort of the way that, if you've ever seen photos from a, a rave or whatever, you'll have the lasers projecting through fog, and when lasers project through fog, you see these undulating currents, these little swirls and eddies. So I made sure to paint those into the blade to make it look like a laser cutting through the fog, or the smoke in this case. Um, what I'm doing now is I'm just sort of making a, a ground line, like a vanishing point, and uh, I'm using a nice kind of unnatural blue to represent it. It will be a nice strong contrast against the warm, uh, hot Omni tool. Um, when you do paintings, it's really good to use hot and cool colors for your highlights. Um, cool colors for the highlight and red and warm colors for the balance or vice versa. I'm also right now just painting in a Reaper, mostly in silhouette. And he's got this nice big scary Cyclopean eye. And the eye sort of hints to the surrounding geometry of his uh, structure, but it doesn't really show all the details because I don't really have time to paint them all. I'm um, doing a little bit of rim lighting on him to show that there's a strong light source beneath, sort of like a magnesium flare or something. And I'm using that color with a color dodge layer to highlight the area around so that the whole background gets tied in once again. The idea is to tie everything together, make it all look like it's a piece of uh, you know, one area, one photograph. And I, I created some poles. Um, the reason I did that was to sort of hint at the scale. Um, so the poles go further away, and the, oh, there we go. So the best way to show scale is to use a human figure or human relatable objects. What I mean by that is when a human eye sees a human figure or something that is human sized, it's a, you know something that you are familiar with using and can tactically or tactilely understand, like a car or a laptop or whatever. Um, you will instantly understand the scale of what you're looking at because your brain will say, okay, well, I know how big I am. I know how big a shovel is. I know how big whatever it is. So next to that, that thing is either really big or really small. Uh, what I'm doing now is I'm sort of painting a background of a burnt out city using the polygonal lasso. The reason I'm using polygonal is because it makes nice straight lines once again. All right, so now I'm just painting in some highlights here and there. Uh, 
just to sort of add some interesting objects to the background and to tie that big dark hulking shape to the right of Shepard to the fore, uh, to the midground on the left of her since she's in the foreground and of course some nice cinematic uh, ashes that never look bad all right so now that we've got uh, that part done we're gonna be tidying the background a little bit more with uh, just some little dabs of paint and here I'm flipping the canvas to test the perspective uh, the, sorry the composition and I also the heads off so we're gonna move the head a little bit to the left to make sure it's centered more correctly this of course requires painting in the background to cover up the little change that I made there not to mention she now has one and a half faces which have to be fixed and bringing it down a little bit. Layers are amazing. I love layers in Photoshop. They're pretty much the reason, other than the cost factor and the time factor, that uh, I use Photoshop exclusively now. I don't really, uh, I don't really uh, use traditional media anymore. There's just so much you can do digitally that you can't do on paper. Once the ink's down on paper, you're done. You can try to paint over it, but uh, it takes time. It's expensive. And it's messy. Whereas digitally you can do it in a couple seconds. Anyway, so we're just painting the background here to fix the little changes I've been making. Got to use the uh, polygonal lasso because uh, I got to keep those edges straight. Alrighty, well done. And there we go. Yeah, perfect. Good job. Okay. Um, so now the arm is still off. It's too far over, so we're going to be bringing that in like so, and painting out the background again. And what I usually do is I'll just sample the area, and then I'll continue the lines as they were going to kind of you know make sure that they're all uh, painted out correctly. It's actually not that hard to do, but uh, to make it look convincing is a little bit more difficult. <laughs> Looks like she has a little bit of a fin or something sticking off the side of her arm. Oh, so this is a fun trick. So what I just did was I got a big texture from my texture um, library. Just some junk. And what we're going to do is paint it in to add some detail to that area that just got painted in. Um, essentially, when you paint stuff in, you generally tend to lose detail. So, um, what I'm doing is I'm just going to uh, make it look like there's actually something, like a pile of rubble or trash or something. Now, the face is a little bit too uh, rough for me right now. Um, oh, really quickly, what I'm doing right there is I'm adding a rim light. So, any sides which are rear lit by the Omni tool will be orange, any sides rear lit by the background will be blue. And to add some depth between the arm and the breastplate, I'm adding some uh, shadows. Here I'm fixing the lighting, making the arm and shoulder guard look more rounded. Okay, anyway, back to the face. Uh, so, what I'm doing is I'm taking some of that cool blue light. And I'm highlighting the side that's facing it. Um, what this does is it adds some more contrast, makes the face more interesting, and in this case, it adds the opportunity to add some rim light around the nose and the mouth. And the edge of the face, of course. I can't stress enough how important rim lighting is. Anyway, um, the face also needed to be softened up and made a little bit more feminine. So this is a good opportunity to do that since we're going to be working on the face. So here we go. Um, the distance between the nose and the top of the lip actually is a more ma uh, the larger the distance, the more masculine a face looks. Um, so by kind of squishing the lips up, you can make the face look more feminine. 
Um, there's a little bit of too strong of a highlight on the lip, so that's going to have to get rounded out a little bit. Looks like she has a duck face right now. And that's what I just started doing there. A little bit more of an intense highlight. It's tough uh, painting faces because there's a lot of geometry in the face. And that geometry is dependent on anatomy. So to get it correct, you have to have a very strong understanding of lighting as well as anatomy. Which is why it takes a lot of work. And I've been painting for years and it still takes me a while to get it just right. So here I'm just uh, fixing the eyes. The eyes are pretty complex. There's a lot of muscles um, as well as um, folds of skin and wrinkles around them. And they can be difficult to get um, to look right. You'll notice there's a slight glitch that just disappeared. There's a little gray and white box that appeared for no reason. My Photoshop does that sometimes. I don't know what the deal is, whether it's running out of processing power or what's going on, but sometimes uh, random pixels will turn white or whatever. So what I'm doing here is I'm tracing the outline of the collar on the neck so that um, I can make the hair look like it's backlit. Since the hair is not 100% opaque, light comes through it. It's just a neat trick to make it look more realistic. What I'm doing now is I'm just taking normal lasso and just painting in some highlights to make the head look more shiny. Alright, so now we're continuing to soften the features. Women tend to have softer features, whereas men has more, have more angular and pronounced features. Um, actually, it's funny because a lot of that has to do with estrogen and uh, <coughs> testosterone. Kind of uh, fixing the nose here. Giving it a little bit of an under light. It's a little bit too scoop-ish. Looks like a duck beak a little bit, so or bill, so smooth it out a little bit. Nice little upturned nose. Very pretty. And we're just continuing to smooth the face out. Some uh Supermodel cheekbones there. So, um, some of the reference stuff from Bioware, she actually had her mouth slightly open with the teeth showing. And I thought that'd be kind of cool to show, but um, I don't know if I actually kept it. I thought it looked like she was a little bit too buck tooth. So we'll see. I don't honestly remember if it's there or not. I don't think it's there anymore. Here I'm just painting some loose hair. Uh, it helps keep the geometry of the head going. That kind of heads are spherical, um, so they have spherical lighting. And by having some loose hair falling down, you can show that. The nose, the nose is never quite right. Now, if you skip back a couple minutes, you'll see how far the face has come. It's completely different from earlier. Here I'm using my infamous... Uh, <clears throat> shrapnel brush as well. Now I'm painting in some details, but the shrapnel brush is a brush I made which adds random details. Uh, it's very useful, it's very quick, and it definitely helps me save time when I work. Now I'm just painting some highlights to make the background a little bit more interesting. All 
right, so here I think I messed with the teeth. I think the problem was I didn't like the gap in the teeth. It made her look like she had bad teeth or something. But right now it looks okay. So maybe I did leave the teeth the way they were. I don't remember. Uh, I decided to do another silhouette of a Reaper. Um, they look like Nautilisks a little bit. Um, but I kind of got faded out. It's really hard to make out and finish these. Adding some freckles as she is a redhead. Trying to find the Mass Effect logo. Ta da! And then my signature, which I keep in its own layer. So I guess the teeth did make it to the end. Interesting. Oh, <laughs> so last ditch thing. Um, I didn't like the composition. I thought it was too stretched. So I ended up just bringing everything in a little bit. Um, it's funny because you would never really know I did it. Um, I actually sort of forgot that I did that myself. See what unifying shadows and highlights can do? It's amazing. You wouldn't even know that was there, no. I thought about doing the um, lens flare there, but it, it, I don't think it turned out looking right. Lens flares are actually pretty easy to make with color dodges and just, you know, ovals that have been transformed. So um, I'm going to put the final image here for a bit to look at. Um, you can also see the full image on my DeviantArt um, <clears throat> for download if you're interested. So uh, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, I know this is one of my favorite pieces to do, and I think it's probably one of my strongest pieces I have at the moment. So um, yeah, uh, I'll have more videos soon, uh, more paintings. Thanks again for coming by. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please uh, like it, subscribe to my channel. Alright, I'll talk to you soon.